Oh, I tell you a very amusing story. I'm going to digress because it all comes back to me in the in the thing. Before we went, when we were in Salisbury Plain, before we went down to, we had to um, do exercises of whether being ambushed. So one Saturday morning, my platoon went out, and the corps of drums was always the enemy. And they would be the enemy, and they would try and ambush you, and you had to learn these special routines. And we had blanks in our rifles, and um, on a Bren gun, which was the automatic gun, you couldn't have blanks as such, but you had to have wooden bullets. And at the end of the, 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 the Bren gun, you had a shredder, so this would shred the bullet as it was fired into small pieces of wood which were still dangerous they, they could you know they wouldn't probably kill you by any manner of means but they could do you a bit of harm anyway this Saturday morning we did this exercise and one of my fusiliers with the Bren gun had failed to get all the, right, the, the rounds out to clear the gun and was sitting there and pulled the trigger and there was a bang and this um, wooden bullet went out it hit the drum major <laughs> hit the drum major here <laughs> so he got little bullets where you wouldn't want little bits of bullets you see god I was frightened I thought oh god I'm going to get court martial for this anyway he went back to the we took, went back to the MO. <laughs> Saturday afternoon, spent his time pulling bits of woods out of. <laughs> I can't remember. My sergeant came up to me. He said, "Drum Major Rose's wife is not very happy with you, sir." <laughs> anyway, so that was another little story. Um, anyway, reverting back to Port Side. Um, we were then told that we were going back to the to wherever. So we got on a troop ship to take us home, the Dilwara, which was a proper troop ship. I remember this. I had contacted a thing called, which I was told I got on when I got on the board the ship, um, called Sandfly Fever. It's a thing where you get a sandfly and you get. And it's a bit like a heavy dose of flu. So my first few days on this ship were lying in bed sweating and thinking, but anyway, I couldn't got over. We stopped at Algiers and we then went through to Southampton. It was a rough old patch through December, through the Bay of Biscay, and there were lots of people, God, the mystics were foul, these troops were sick and oh God going down there the smell was nauseating um, but we got back we got back just in time for Christmas in 1956 and I know I phoned my mother and I said you better get a Christmas lunch because I'm I, hopefully I'll be home and sure enough I think she was very welcome to see me it is, you know, strange, really, that um, parents and all these guys in Afghanistan and wherever you like Iraq, you don't realise what, um, although, you know, we didn't have heavy action, you don't realise what a, any sort of military operation like that does to parents and wives and things like that. I mean... It's just, it's, it's pretty awful for them. I know my mother was um, very upset and followed it. Anyway, came back to um, Dover and I stayed with the, the battalion for a few more months. Because what had happened, in fact, I had joined the, the thing in April, in October 54, I should have been due out in October 56 but the colonel said to me he said 
um, we have no more trained assault pioneer officers. Would you stay on? So I said, well, I was going to ask you if I, was going to, if I could stay on. You know, 18, 19-year-old, you want a bit of fun, don't you, and things. Or so I stayed on. I signed what was known as a gentleman's agreement. Gentleman's agreement was something that the army could keep you as long as they want and you couldn't do anything about it. But they could say to you, you can go now. And so I think it was April, May 57. I said to them, you know, I think I should go. There's nothing much for me here. And so I left. But um, that was my experience of the army. Um, I enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun. Um, there were a few frightening moments. Uh, I enjoyed the company. I wouldn't have missed it for anything. And it taught me, having been, been a very closeted life, really, um, I, I lost my father in 42 and I was an only child. I was sent away to a boarding school. Um, and I didn't... I mixed with all people that I didn't know, and I learnt a tremendous amount. I learnt more in those nearly three years in the army than I did for the rest of my life. It really was an eye-opener. Um, and I enjoyed it, and I got on well with everybody. And then, of course, I joined the association. I'm now chairman of the 1R, well, that's one Fusiliers Association here, and also chairman of the Royal Regiment of Fusiliers, Kent and South East Branch. So I'm quite involved, I enjoy it, and I enjoy the regiment. It's a wonderful regiment, and I'm only sorry that we've lost a battalion. Now, is there anything else you want to say to me? Stephen, have you got any questions that have been left unanswered by that? Do um, I, I've got a couple about the Suez. Yeah, I do. Um... Because you're a national serviceman, do you think, uh, do you think that the regular soldiers' attitudes were different? Uh, sorry, uh, what, what were the regular soldiers' attitudes towards national, the national servicemen? Um, there was no difference at all. Absolutely none. When they were in the battalion, in a platoon, they were all the same. They didn't actually... Um, if you take Korea, for instance, which I wasn't there because I was too young, there were loads of national servicemen killed, lots of national servicemen fighting out there. So, um, you know, there was no difference. I didn't think there was any difference. And they didn't, they certainly didn't have any, um, at least I certainly never noticed any difference between their attitude towards national service officers to regular officers. None at all. Um, no, it was very, very, very... Um, an, an, an easy existence, I thought. Um, I mean, obviously, there were different sorts of people. You know, you can't take that, but you take that in all walks of life. But I think if you went in with an open mind and went there to, to learn, um, inform, educate, it was a fine. I mean, when I um, was about, when I went back to Dover after Suez, my company commander, who was Major John Gerard, who was a lovely man, said to me, John, why don't you stay on? I was very, very tempted to stay, to become a regular, because I really did enjoy it. Um, I didn't, and the reason I didn't was the fact that we had a business, a family business, and I was the last Sheldon to keep the family name going. And I went into this business, it was textiles, um, up in a place called Macclesfield in Cheshire. There was, uh, there was one other thing I thought Stephen might want to ask you about, what, whether you think national service should be brought back. Yeah. No, definitely not. 
Not in this day and age. I don't think so. It was a different circumstances there. The British government had a lot of commitments overseas still at the end of the war, and they had to have it. They stopped it in 1960 because it was... It, was, it wasn't doing the army any good. You know, you've got people coming in and out and in and out. There was no continuity. No, I don't think national service... I mean, you know, if you want to join the army, join the army. Join the army for a minimum amount of time. I think your minimum amount of time is about five years. A jolly good experience if you want to do it. But um, I don't think national service should be brought back.